Good morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Scott Harris. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Baptist Church in Millersville. Um, it is good to see everyone this morning. Uh, for those that are uh, joining us via the live stream, we wish you a good morning as well. Um, I do have just a few announcements, a few things that I want to draw your attention to before we move ahead with our service this morning. Uh, the first thing I want to share with you is that you may notice that we are not in the auditorium this morning. Um, we are still uh, waiting for a few things to, uh, to be delivered. Obviously, COVID um, has slowed down a few things, so uh, we're waiting for those that we can set up and uh, be able to worship upstairs. So we are um, making use of this space yet again. We're grateful for your flexibility in that. We're grateful that we can uh, utilize the technology that we have and the, the space in the building that we have. Um, but we are hopefully moving up there soon. Um, we're getting closer by the day, so uh, continue to, uh, to pray for those who are doing the work. We're grateful for their time and effort and skill, um, but we're also just uh, praying for shipping to be quicker and things of that nature, too. Uh, one of the other things that, that I just want to draw your attention to, on the back table, you'll notice there is a spot for uh, worship registries. Worship registries um, not only allow us to track who's here, but it also allows you uh, the ability to speak with us. If there's a prayer request or uh, a remark or something that you want the pastors or the elders of the church at large to be aware of, um, that you can fill that out and utilize that. Um, we just take, ask that you take one, um, and then you fill it out, and then you put it in the basket on the back table um, when the service is over, that would be wonderful, and we're grateful for that as well. Um, uh, an email goes out each week with those prayer requests on it. The email comes out on Tuesday, um, but there's also an email that comes out on Friday with the bulletin and the announcements and things like that. Um, a couple of things that you may have seen on the bulletin um, email that came out on Friday. Uh, one is elder nominations. You can get an elder nomination form upstairs um, in the foyer on the table. Um, elder nominations are due on January 3rd. Uh, on the back of the nomination form is a list of those men who are eligible to become elders. Um, if there's somebody that you uh, have been praying about and, and feel that they would make a good elder, we encourage you to speak to them, uh, fill out the form and turn that in, um, and we would appreciate that. We have three men coming off the board uh, this year, and we would like to replace that with three new men. So if you could fill that out, uh, that would be great, and we would appreciate that. Those have to be returned uh, to John Rhodes' mailbox um, by January 3rd. Another thing that you may have seen in the weekly email that came out on Friday is our Christmas Eve service. Our Christmas Eve service will take place. Uh, we have created multiple services and a sign-up list to help in our spacing and distancing. Um, if you have not yet signed up, we would encourage you to take a look at that and do that. Um, if you're interested in, in signing up, if you have a larger group, um, you can fill that out as well. Um, Pastor Joel is, is um, trying to fill up those services before we create even more. Um, so right now we have two services scheduled for Christmas Eve, but we can schedule more if needed be. So if you've not yet done that or you're waiting, don't wait. Go ahead and do that. Um, and that link is in the email that came out this past Friday um, if you're looking for that. Um, I'm just looking over my announcements. Um, Pyro in PJs is tonight. Our Christmas party is taking on a different look as we try to um, adjust to the way things have to be done currently. But we still want to have a good time tonight, so we're going to encourage those that are, um, are willing to wear PJs. I've already been told I have to, um, but you don't have to. You can wear anything comfortable or just your street clothes. Nobody will... Uh, We'll criticize you for that, but we have lots of games planned. We have a few gifts to give out, um, and the Blender of Doom will make its appearance. So um, we have that scheduled, and the time is adjusted. So we are meeting from 5 o'clock to 7.30 just to give us a little more time with each other instead of our normal 6 to 7.30. So make the adjustment in your calendar, 5 o'clock. Uh, we begin for that tonight. We encourage masks being worn into the building, masks being worn exiting the building, and then also uh, while we sing. We're, again, grateful for your willingness to um, be flexible um, as we do these recommendations. So um, we're thankful for that. I believe that's all the announcements I have, and we'll turn it over to Ryan and Kelly. 
It is great to be here, even though we're downstairs again for another week. It is great to be gathered with the people of God um, and to join with the angels this morning in proclaiming and celebrating Christ's birth. So I invite you all to stand and let's lift our voices together and uh, bring him praise.
Would you bow your hearts in prayer with me this morning, please? Heavenly Father, we are uh, thankful that we can come together and worship you in this space. We thank you that we have brothers and sisters uh, to stand next to and sing with. Father, we're, we're grateful that you brought this community together, that we can worship you, uh, that we can glorify you. We recognize that all the work being done in this building, um, Father, is just out of your kindness for us. It is our hope that we are able to uh, use this space well, that the things that are spoken from, taught, uh, preached, sung, Father, that, that it would be about your gospel and the truth would ring out from this place for years and years and years, that those leaving here would proclaim the good news of your risen son. Father, we are um, thankful that we can come together. We're thankful that even as the auditorium is, is not quite finished, that we still have this space to meet. We're thankful for the technology that we have. Father, we're thankful for the people that can come together and make the adjustments and lead well. Father, we also recognize that in the midst of, of all of these things that um, it's not always the way we want. Father, that, that we have to make adjustments. Things aren't happening in the way that, that we feel we even deserve. But, but Father, even in the, this season of Christmas, as we celebrate this season, oh, we have to make adjustments. We're not able to, to visit the way we want or to congregate the way we wish. But, but Father, you have taught us that you are greater than a space. We recognize that in the midst of the season, we have so many things to be thankful for. Father, we're grateful for the bright lights in these dark times. Father, we're, we're thankful for the colored lights and the, the twinkling lights that we see light up the night. We're thankful for the, for the fun Christmas decorations that we see. We're thankful for the, for the red poinsettias and the, the green trees. We're thankful for the, for the food that we eat this season, all the, the treats and the cookies that we have. Father, that, that this allows us to, to feast and enjoy all the many blessings you have given us. We're thankful for the gifts of your good hands. We're thankful for the sounds of Christmas hymns that we're able to sing together as we raise our voices in praise of you. We're thankful for the sound of children laughing this season and the anticipation that they have. Father, we also recognize that, that this is a season that, that is joyful, cheerful, hopeful. But we also know that there are those among us who are also suffering. And, and loneliness can seem even lonelier this time of year. And estrangement can feel cold. Grief even runs deeper. Father, it is easy for us to become worrisome and fearful in this. Oh, but this is a season of joy and hope. May we continue to remind ourselves that, that your presence is with us. Your son, Emmanuel, God is with us. And this Christmas, we want to be finding you. We want to be finding you in the silence of the morning. We want to find you in the smile and laughter of a child. We want to find you in the starry sky at night. We want to find you in the, the longing of embrace and handshakes, Father. We want to find you in this familiar Christmas story, and we want to find you even oh, in discussions with those that we have differences with. Emmanuel, God is with us. Father, help us to give with generous hearts. Help us to receive with thankfulness. Allow us to show patience and grace and understanding in the face of irritation and frustration. Allow us to show kindness in the face of anger. Fill us with contentment and peace. Father, we ask that you would remove jealousy from us. And would we celebrate your birth in ways that would give you 
honor in everything that we say and do. You are with us. And Father, we give you thanks for that truth this morning. We thank you that we can again come together and worship you knowing that your presence is here. And Father, we thank you for your Son. And it's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen. Would you turn with me to Luke chapter 1? Luke chapter 1. We're going to read verses 67 through 79 this morning. Um, And as you turn there, uh, it's an interesting passage because it's a song of both praise and prophecy of Zechariah. But in the verses just before, he couldn't even talk to pronounce the name of his son. He had to write it on a tablet because he doubted the the angel when he said that that his wife would bring forth a son. And the first words that we hear recorded from Zechariah are the song of praise about John, who is going to be the last prophet about the Messiah. Notice what he says, starting in verse 67 of Luke chapter 1. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember the holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hands of our enemies and enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you all to stand as we continue singing.
Bibles, if you would please, and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, as we continue working our way through this book, Matthew chapter 11, and I'm going to read the first 19 verses of the Gospel of the Good News about Jesus according to Matthew. Uh, next week, Lord willing, when we're together, we'll be in the Gospel of John, the chap- uh, John chapter 1 for a couple of weeks, but today we're going to be in Matthew 11. Talk about an event from the uh, life of the man whose birth uh, Jared read about this morning from Luke. Matthew 11, verse 1. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back to John and report what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And, if you are willing to accept it, he is the light, the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others, We played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they said, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking and they say, Here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. In a sermon he preached years ago about this, D.A. Carson uh, uh, described an episode in the life of evangelist George Whitfield. Are you familiar with George Whitfield? Here he is, his picture. He was not known as a handsome fellow. But he was one of the greatest evangelists ever in the history of the church. He was born in England, and he uh, spent went on great ministry tours in the American colonies at the time. He crossed the Atlantic 13 times. Um, he was, when he was alive, he was the most well-known person in the American colonies. He was only surpassed in fame a few years after he died by George Washington. Uh, Whitfield would preach to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. He was a good friend of Benjamin Franklin, as a matter of fact. Uh, Franklin printed all of his sermons, so he made money off of Whitfield's evangelism. Well, uh, Whitfield married late in life, and by all accounts, it was a very unhappy marriage. But God in his providence provided them with a child, a son. And one time Whitfield was away traveling uh, on a ministry tour and he received word that his son was sick, very sick. So Whitfield set to praying and he prayed. He prayed fervently, fervently that God would heal his son. And he actually had assurance in his heart that God had heard him and was going to answer him and was going to heal his son. And in fact, he told other people about it. He said, my son is sick, but I have prayed and God's going to answer and God's going to heal my son and he's going to recover. But he didn't. His son died. And Whitfield spent the next six months in mourning and grief over the loss of his son. He wasn't just mourning, though, for his son. He was actually grieving and mourning over the implications of what happened with his son for his relationship with God. Why didn't God hear? Why didn't God answer? 
Why was I so sure that my son was going to recover and he, he didn't? You can imagine some of the things that went through his mind, right? The doubt and the discouragement and the despair. How do you pray after that? How, how do you keep praying after you prayed for your son and you were so sure he was going to get better and nothing happened? Surely he must have felt very alone during this period of time. He wasn't, and he wasn't in that experience either because some of you have been in that very same sort of position, wondering where God was and what God was doing. We find John the Baptist in a similar position here in Matthew chapter 11. Uh, Some people have found this passage in the questions that he asked John the Baptist, asking Jesus, are you the one to come? Some people have found this kind of embarrassing in the text, a little troubling. How can it be that the forerunner would would wonder about Jesus? How how can he be in such despair or discouragement? Uh, Why would Matthew record this? Sometimes you read the Gospels and you think to yourself, these are the worst people for public relations ever. But I, actually, I, I'm, I'm quite thankful that, these, that this story is here. I find it comforting. I find it comforting to read here how the Bible responds to doubt and discouragement. Jesus is more tolerant of John's doubts than he could have been. He might be more tolerant of John's doubts than you are with your own doubts. Today what I want to do is I want to talk with you about doubting John. We're going to talk about John's doubts and why he doubted and how Jesus responded. Frankly, though, there's a lot more in this passage, in this this section of scripture that's about John. Um, Jesus talks about John and his doubts, and then he is going to talk to us about what it means to be great. Is there anybody here who aspires to greatness? Jesus would like to have a word with you. And he talks about how God's plans have unfolded, how his uh, plan to rescue people has unfolded. And then Jesus also talks about the issue of unbelief. Why is it that there's so many people who don't believe? There's a difference between unbelief and doubt. And Jesus is going to finish this passage by talking about unbelief. I want to walk through the passage with three headings. They're not fancy. They're just descriptive of the content of the passage, which would get me a failing grade in a homiletics class, but that's okay. We'll start number one, John's doubts about Jesus. Let's talk about John's doubts about Jesus. Remember the structure of Matthew. We've been in this book for several uh, months, and uh, Matthew begins the introduction. He talks about Jesus' birth, his uh, baptism, his uh, temptation, and then his conclusion, he talks about his crucifixion and his resurrection. And in between, there is a series of five sermons. This is how Matthew organizes his material, uh, five sermons. And in between those five sermons, there's episodes, uh, conversations, miracles that Jesus has with people. And those accounts often reflect back on the sermons. We just finished the sermon on mission where Jesus sends out the 12 and he tells them that they're going to experience hostility that they haven't experienced yet. Uh, They're going to experience a persecution and criticism. And here's that first scene right after the sermon on mission. And you wouldn't expect that the pushback would come from John the Baptist, that the first person who would object would be John. John's in prison. We know about this. Matthew told us in chapter 4. He told us that John uh, had been arrested. And when we get to Matthew 14, we're going to see more of the story about how or why John is in prison. If this were the 60s, we describe it as uh, uh, John spoke truth to power and got put in prison for it. We'll get to that in Matthew uh, 14. Uh, ancient, uh, ancient historian tells us that John was in the uh, fortress, one of Herod's fortress prisons called Micaeus on the east side of the Dead Sea. He's been there, we think, about a year at this point in time, and he's allowed visitors when he's in prison under these conditions. In fact, Herod would often talk to him, but then there were disciples of John that came and talked to him, and they told him about Jesus and what Jesus was doing, and to John, something seems off doesn't seem quite right. Matthew in in verse 2 says, calls Jesus the Messiah. He doesn't call Jesus the Messiah like that very often in his book. But before John raises his questions, Matthew wants to give you certainty 
This is Jesus, the Messiah. It's for sure the Messiah, even though John is not quite sure about that. Are you, verse 3, the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Why is John uncertain? Why is John starting to have doubts about who Jesus is? I think it has something to do with the way John has introduced Jesus. Uh, keep your finger in Matthew 11 and flip back with me to Matthew 3 for a moment. I know we've looked at Matthew 3, but I want to look with you again at how John introduced Jesus. And, and you will see maybe here some of the reason why John is uncertain. Matthew 3, verse 11. John's preaching. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, what's the difference between John's introduction of Jesus and what Jesus has been doing so far? There's been a lot of healing a lot of compassion on Jesus' part, but I bet this is Matt, uh, John's question. Where's the fire? Where's the winnowing fork? Where's the threshing floor that you're going to come and clear? I mean, uh, these miracles and the blessings, that's wonderful, but where's the fire? John's even in prison. Think about this. Ha. Jesus, I've got, a, I've got a target in mind for your fire. I'm in prison. If you're the Messiah, surely you would come and get me out of prison and rescue me. What? Are, are you really him? What's, what's going on here? Now, uh, we can cut John some slack. I think we should. I think we should cut some, John some slack. He doesn't understand. He doesn't understand uh, Jesus' unfolding mission. And he's not the only one in the Gospel of Matthew who doesn't understand. In fact, his disciples don't understand. They don't understand through the entire book. And even at the end, after the crucifixion and resurrection, Matthew says, you know, the disciples gather around Jesus. At, but he says, but some doubted. Even, at, even then... They just don't seem to understand. They don't understand that Jesus is both Lord and Savior. That he's both judge and redeemer. They don't understand that he has come to uh, rescue his people, not only from the evil that's in the world out there, but also to rescue them from the evil that's inside their hearts. And this is where he's going to start. They don't understand that the first time that he came, he came to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins on the cross. And the second time he comes, he will come to judge and rule and reign. They don't understand that. When we get to Matthew 16, we'll focus, we'll zero in on the disciples and their confusion. Here it's John, and he doesn't understand either. Now, we should look at John's, uh, Jesus' response and how kind and gentle it is. Verse 4 Go tell John what you hear and see. And then he recounts some of his miracles. The blind see, uh, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. Uh, all of these miracles are recorded for us in Matthew 8 and 9. In fact, when we were walking through Matthew 8 and 9, remember, maybe you remember we came to Matthew 11 to see why are these miracles recorded. They're recorded here because, uh, as evidence rather, that Jesus is the Messiah. But Jesus... Um, refers or uses language and wording here that is intentionally echoing and paraphrasing, even quoting here from two passages in Isaiah, Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 60 that are about the Messiah. Jesus is putting what he's doing in the context of the Old Testament prophecies about the one who is to come. That's good. That's good for John because John knows the book of Isaiah well. And John would know that those passages also refer to not just these blessings and these miracles, but these, those passages also refer to judgment. Jesus is in effect saying to John, yes, John, I understand judgment and it is coming. I know what I'm about, son. I understand. It, you could maybe picture it like this. Uh, John is building a house, a theological house, his understanding of God's unfolding plans. And there's a house, the center beam in this house is called the Messiah. And he knows how big that beam has to be. He's read the book of Isaiah. He knows how long that beam has to be. He sees Jesus and Jesus isn't quite long enough. Or so he pictures. 
So he imagines. And, and Jesus gets out the Isaiah tape measure and he lays it down and he says, oh, John, trust me, I fit. I'll fit perfectly as the Messiah, the one who is to come. And then he offers this encouragement to John, verse 6. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Is this how you would expect Jesus to respond to doubts? He doesn't dismiss John. He doesn't condemn John. He doesn't belittle John. He doesn't throw his hands up in the air and say, some people, you just can't trust them. He doesn't do anything like that. He takes his question seriously. He responds plainly. And then he very gently calls John to, to persevere. There's blessings for you, John. Stick with it, John. Is that how you respond to doubt? Is that how you would respond if your son or your daughter came to you with significant doubts about what we believe about the Lord Jesus? I think you'd be tempted, I would be tempted. Wouldn't you be tempted to be afraid in that moment? More chiding than gentle, more insecure and frightened? Or what, what happens when those doubts, doubts like this run through your own mind? Self-condemnation. What's wrong with you? Get it together. Other people don't have this problem. People at church trust you fine. What's, what's wrong? What is wrong with you? Why can't you have the faith other people do? Or, or maybe even bitterness, not self-condemnation, not fear, maybe bitterness or anger. Why doesn't God take this away from me? Doubt comes in all kinds of places. Sometimes people struggle with intellectual doubts. Doubts about the veracity of what the Bible says. This week, I listened to a podcast about fabric, uh, how human beings develop the technology to make the uh, fabric, to, to make thread and to weave uh, fabric and to dye it. It was a, a fascinating podcast about technology and business and uh, uh, development. It was very interesting. Did you know, uh, I learned this. In the average pair of jeans, if you were to take your jeans and completely unravel them, uh, and you would be a better Baptist, but, but you would, if you completely, just kidding about that, if you completely unraveled them, you, it would be six miles of thread. There's six miles of thread in an average pair of jeans. Well, uh, while I was listening to the podcast, this expert about uh, fabric was talking about the history of why human beings started wearing clothing and how clothing changed. And she's giving time frames and reasons. And I, she, as she's speaking, I think to myself, that's not what the Bible says. We know why human beings started wearing clothing and where clothing came from. You can't even listen to a podcast about fabric without somebody throwing the Bible under the bus, Right? It's everywhere. There's just uh, all, all, all different kinds of places in the world. There are reasons why you should doubt the veracity of scriptures g given by people. Some people have moral doubts. Here's the great issue that uh, we will continue to face in the years that are to come. If God is good, why is he so restrictive when it comes to human sexual relationships? Why doesn't God approve of love? Why doesn't God want people to be happy? Why is he so restrictive and so intolerant? Doesn't God recognize love? He can't be good if he's that close-minded. Some people, their doubts are born of their own suffering. If, if God loves me, why won't he take the pain away? Why... Is he making this so hard? Why is he making it so hard for me to trust him in the midst of this pain that I have? I'm not trying to valorize doubt. I'm not trying to praise doubt. So there are some people who think that doubt is, is a sign of maturity and wisdom, that, that certainty is a sign of arrogance and pride, and I'm not arrogant, I'm not proud. I doubt everything, and therefore I'm mature and insightful and wise, and, and as if doubt is something to be praised. Oh, wow, you're so smart, you're so deep, because you don't believe anything about anybody. Wow. Doubt, doubt isn't a place to rest. Doubt, doubt is like a cold morning. 
you had this experience, you're standing in your house and you look outside and, and 15 feet down the sidewalk is your newspaper. It's early in the morning, it's still kind of dark out. You don't have clothes, you got your jammies and your robe on and, and no one will see you, right? You can run out and, and get your newspaper, right? Uh, my dog and I walk around town early in the morning. It's awesome when you see somebody coming out to get their newspaper in the morning in their pajamas because they're horrified. Here I come trucking along with my dog, and there they are with their Hello Kitty jammies, and I saw them. It's just the best. But you, you run outside real quick, you grab the newspaper, and you run back inside, and it's because it's cold out there, and you want to be... The Tao is like that. It's like being outside in the cold, and there, you, the, the, the get inside, you find shelter. And when, when you do here, look... Jesus is ready for you. He's inside to welcome you back in to the warmth. John's doubts arise from the fact that there is a distinction, a contrast between what he expects God to do and what God actually is doing at this point in time. And John can make a biblical case for it. He could say, no, Jesus, Isaiah says you're going to bring the fire. Where's the fire? He can make a biblical case, but... Uh, that's not what Jesus is, is doing. Don Carson, in that same sermon he preached about this passage, said that uh, as followers of Jesus, one of the things we do is we return over and over and over again to the scriptures because we need to have a constant reshaping and reframing of our understanding of the goodness and the sovereignty and the mystery and the providence of God. We do not hold God accountable to do things that he never promised to do. Sometimes it feels like your, your faith is like a Jenga tower and something happens to you and, and they pull that piece out and it collapses. It's a painful process. We go back to the scriptures, back to the scriptures again. What Has God genuinely promised? What has he said? And look at the Jesus you encounter in that process. This one who when John comes, John who should have known better, sometimes you just can't trust people. That's that's not how Jesus reacts. Very gently, very patiently welcomes John's question. Just so you get a better understanding of who he is, Jesus continues here in this passage. Uh, We learn more about him. Secondly, what I want to do is I want to talk about how Jesus defends John. Jesus defends John. We'll start here in about verse 7 and following. There were apparently people listening in to John's questions or the disciples of John's, their question. And maybe they, Jesus is concerned that they're going to start having these negative thoughts about John, that they're going to reject John. Oh, John, he's faithless. So Jesus defends John. He asks this question three times. What did you go out to see? What did you go out to see in the wilderness? Why did you go out in the wilderness to listen to this man? Did you go out to see a fickle person, a reed blown about by the wind? John's not fickle. John is not fickle. John's stubborn. He's not fickle. Or did you go out to see someone who's got fancy clothes, a a celebrity, Uh, 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 an Instagram influencer who hangs out in all the cool places with all the cool people and tells you the colors of the year for next year? Did you go to see somebody like that with his fancy slippers and his silk robe? Is that that who you went to? That's not John either. No, this dude eats bugs, right? Okay, that's not John. Who did you go out to see? You went out to see a prophet. And in fact, he is more than a prophet. Now, how could he be more than a prophet? He's more than a prophet in that he is the subject of prophecy. He is God's spokesman. There hasn't been a prophet from God for 400 years. Now there's a prophet who's come, and he is not just a prophet. He's the subject of prophecy. The prophets speak about him. Now, starting at verse 10, we're going to talk and listen. We're going to listen to Jesus speak about John. What's interesting is Matthew records these Things because Matthew wants to say something about Jesus, and he says something about Jesus by telling us what Jesus said about John. Matthew, uh, Jesus speaks here, and either he is a lunatic or he is the God man. That can 
must be the only two uh, options here in what he says. Uh, let, me, let me show that to you. So Jesus, uh, John is more than a prophet because he's a subject of prophecy. And Jesus in verse 10 quotes from Malachi 3.1. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Now, look at Malachi 3.1. If you were to look just a couple pages but before this in your Bible at Malachi 3.1. Uh, it says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. God speaking. The prophet is quoting God. What's the difference between Malachi 3.1 and the way Jesus quotes Malachi 3.1? In Malachi 3.1, the original, uh, the prophet, God is speaking. I will send my messenger ahead of me who will prepare the way before me. But Jesus says, I will send my messenger ahead of you as if Yahweh is speaking to someone else. Who is God, Yahweh of the Old Testament, speaking to? Jesus says he's speaking to me. He put himself in this passage about God. That's pretty audacious, right? Uh, so then uh, he says in verse 11, he says, I tell you, among those born of women, there's not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Think about this verse with me. No one up to John greater than John the Baptist. No one. You want to start asking questions. Greater than David? Greater than David. Greater than Moses? Yep. Greater than Abraham? Yep. That's impossible. How can someone be greater than Moses, David, Abraham? That's impossible. Uh, but Jesus says he is. And the reason that John the Baptist is greater than all those people, Jesus says, is because he introduced me. That's audacious. Let's so imagine. Uh, we occasionally do this at our church when we have one of our outreach partners or an outreach par partner come and visit. I stand up and introduce them. The last uh, outreach partner we had, I think, was uh, Mike Shibley. And Mike and Lauren Shibley were here. And I stood up and introduced them. And then the Shibleys came up and talked about their prospective missionary, uh, mission work in Papua New Guinea. What would it have been like if Mike said, as he stood up, if he had said, Joel Divini is the greatest human being that has ever been born because he introduced me. I don't think Mike would be on our short list for missionary support, right? I mean, that's just crazy. Except this is what Jesus says. John the Baptist is the greatest person who's ever been born because he introduced me. Now, we're going to come back to that. He, he talks about greatness here a little bit. We're going to come back to that. I, I want to show you what he says uh, about John's testimony about him starting at verse 12. But picture it like this here. Jesus and John are not like Chip and Dale, the Disney chipmunks. You know the Disney chipmunks, Chip and Dale? They're sickeningly polite to one another. After you. No, after you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, after you. After you. Oh, thank you. Indubitably, right? Right. They're so polite and they outdo one another in trying to honor each other. That is not what's happening here in this passage. Jesus is not saying, oh, John, he's a great guy. No, he's saying he's great, but second best. Well, look, um, why didn't John have, even though he is introducing Jesus and is great in that reason, for that reason, why, why is he in prison? Well, verse 12 tells us, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. Is that what your translation says? Verse 12 is a very difficult passage to translate. The issue is, is the kingdom of heaven, we're not sure about this verb, it does the, the kingdom of heaven do the violence or has it received the violence? Has it been, my, my translation has a footnote, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing or is it receiving the violence? Then in which case both parts of verse 12 would be saying the same thing. The kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence. Violent people have been raiding it. I'm not sure which it is. You can understand both. How both could be true. Um, violent people have been opposing John and Jesus. It's true. Or it's also possible that Jesus says 
the kingdom of heaven has been pillaging the kingdom of darkness. When Jesus comes, he robs Satan of his supremacy. He takes back people from the dead and he casts out demons. He's been pillaging the kingdom of darkness. Maybe that's what he's saying. I'm, I'm not sure which. And the, the, the original language is difficult to decipher. The, the point is that the, there's, there's been opposition to John, even though he's great and even though he's been testified, there's been violent opposition. But, verse 13, John is the culmination of the Old Testament. All the prophets in the law prophesied until John. He's the culmination of the 39 books of the Hebrew Scriptures, and he is Elijah. Here again, he's referring to the book of Malachi. Malachi 4 5, God says this. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Now, some people thought that, that John was Elijah reincarnated or Elijah risen from the dead. And, and uh, John the Baptist in John chapter 1, the gospel chapter 1 said, no, I am not John in that sense. I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not Elijah in that sense. I'm not Elijah in the sense that uh, I am him risen from the dead. But Jesus here is affirming he, that John came like Elijah and preached like Elijah and had a message that was as poignant as Elijah's was. John is great. John is great because he testifies to the Lord Jesus. He introduces the Lord Jesus, which takes me back to, John, uh, to verse 11 where he says this brief meditation on greatness. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's astounding. He's talking about you. He's talking about you. Let's line up everybody who's been born from the beginning of time up until John, and we're going to line them up according to not height or not age or not wealth. We're going to line them up by greatness, according to Jesus' standards, greatness. Who's first in line? John the Baptist. Then we're going to take everybody who is a follower of Jesus, um, who uh, has turned to Jesus, part of the kingdom, after his resurrection, we're going to line them up, again, not by height, not by chronology, not by um, uh, basketball skills. We're going to line them up by greatness. The last person in that second line is still ahead of John the Baptist. How can that be? Uh, I was at Lowe's the other day buying some things, and there were a lot of people, and the lines were long, and I was at the back of a line, uh, there were a couple people ahead of me, and, and uh, another cashier decided to open up another register, and he pointed at me and said, sir, come with me, and I'll check you out over here. And I walked up to the counter, and the people that were ahead of me were like, hey, come on, right? You've had that experience. I went with the man gleefully to his cash register so he could check me out, and all the other people that, oh, come on. John the Baptist, you're great. See this person? least in the kingdom of heaven, they're greater than you. Now what? How, how can Jesus say this? What, what is he talking about? Remember, the standard of greatness, according to the Lord Jesus in this passage, is testifying about Jesus, speaking about him, testifying to him. John died, he was executed before the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And if you're a believer today, you know more about Jesus' glory than John did when he was alive because you can testify to the fact that Jesus died and rose again. And by that standard, because you have more to say about Jesus, you are greater than John. Here is the standard of greatness. You have more to share about the Lord Jesus and therefore are greater. Now I want you to think with me for a minute about how you think about greatness. Does anybody here aspire to greatness? Some of you aspire to greatness to be a great golfer or maybe a great uh, student or a great baker. You've been working at it for a couple decades. You aspire to be a great baker. You aspire to be a great boss or aspire to be a great parent. 
Maybe, maybe you don't aspire to be great. Maybe, maybe you're a little more humble than that. You, I mean, Lincoln was great, and Michael Jordan is great, and Beyonce is great, but, but I, I just want to be admired, uh, well-recognized. I just want to be um, appreciated for what I can do. Here's what makes you great according to the Lord Jesus, testifying about him. That's the standard of greatness in this passage. One wonders if there's going to be a great reordering in the kingdom of heaven. Let's imagine that we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and by our standards we line up in an order. Do you suppose that the Lord Jesus is going to reorder whatever order we pick according to his standards of greatness? See how this connects to the end of Matthew? Because at the end of Matthew, Jesus says to the disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I am with you always. Go tell people about me. And that is greatness. This is why we seek to glorify the Lord Jesus in everything we do. We seek to glorify him in everything we do because this is greatness, whether we're on the golf course or in the classroom or at home changing diapers or at work fixing cars. We do everything we can to glorify the Lord Jesus because that is greatness. This is why we're interested in outreach partners and why we want to talk about missions because we have a great message and there is greatness found in spreading this great message about the Lord Jesus. Devote your life to glorifying him in everything that you do. We have so much about him to say, and Jesus says that is greatness. Now, there's one more piece in this passage that we should talk about. Jesus finishes by describing unbelief. And again, why is it that John's in prison and Jesus hasn't conquered the world yet here in this, in this, at this juncture? Look how Jesus describes the generation that he's talking to, the the men and women that were alive in his audience. He says, to what shall I compare this generation? This generation, think about it, this should have been the most faithful generation of any generation that's ever lived because they saw Jesus. They heard John. They saw Jesus do the miracles. They listened to him preach. Some of them had been healed by Jesus. This should have been the most faithful group of people that has ever lived. Not so, Jesus says. And then Jesus talks about some children that he's watched in the marketplace playing. That's where you would go to play with your friends. And he has some observations to make about them. You know what this is like. Let's just imagine you can put yourself in the the shoes of these children that Jesus has observed. Your dad went into the living room where the television is and said, That's it, boys and girls. No more screen time for today. You're done. No more screen time. Go find something else to do. And you say, ah, what are we going to do? And he says, I don't care. It's not going to involve a screen. Out you go. So you and your brothers and sisters have a discussion about what you're going to do. And somebody says, let's play wedding. We'll get all our stuffed animals down here and we'll put them up in rows. And and Mr. Fluffy Kins can be the father of the bride. And you can be the bride and you can be the groom. And I'll be the preacher and you'll be a bridesmaid and you'll be a groomsman. We'll play wedding. And then when we're done, we'll play reception and we'll have cool music and we'll dance around. It'll be so much fun. And somebody says, that's stupid. No. All right. I got an idea. Let's play funeral. Mr. Fluffykins can be the corpse. Then they'll be fighting about whether or not to kill Mr. Fluffykins. And, and he can be the corpse. And you can be the pallbearers. And I'll be the preacher. And, and we'll play really sad music and pretend to be really sad. No, that's dumb. I don't want to do that either. Did you ever have conversations like that with your brothers and sisters? Uh, Jesus says... John came and his preaching was dark. He preached repentance. He preached judgment. He preached warnings. And you looked at him and said, somebody that dark can't be from God. No. And Jesus says, I came. He talks about himself in the third person, verse 19. The son of man came and I'll paraphrase this just so it irks you a little bit. Jesus says, I came and I liked to party. I know that phrase, 
describes a whole bunch of behaviors that we do want to attribute to the Lord Jesus. But that's how the Pharisees and the religious teachers would feel about the choices that Jesus made. He, uh, John at least had the decency to fast. Uh, uh, I mean, he fasted too much. But at least he fasted a little. Jesus doesn't fast. He likes to eat. He likes to drink. And you should see, you should see the people that Jesus hangs out with. It's terrible. You wouldn't let your own kids hang out with the people that Jesus hangs out with. And we're not going to listen to Jesus either because that guy can't be telling us the truth. I mean, look at him. Jesus is revealing to us that there is more than one way to be lost. There's more than one way to be alienated from God. Jared Wilson, I, I listened to a sermon he preached uh, a couple years ago. I listened to it this week. And uh, he talked about his commute, his 20 to 30 minute commute to work. And he said, think about your commute. Isn't it true that everybody on the road, the people who are driving with you as you're, you're getting to work, half of them drive too fast and half of them drive too slow? Isn't that how that is? I mean, some people just drive too fast and they're reckless. It's crazy. And then some people, I don't know, they're not, apparently not going anywhere because they're so slow. And do you know why everybody either drives too fast or too slow? Because you are the golden mean of speed. And, and, and if everybody drove your speed, the whole world would be a better place because you know exactly how fast fast should be. And you are wise in your understanding of mechanics and cars and travel. John, he's too dark. He's too negative. Jesus, no. No, he's, he's, he's not serious enough. Unbelief. Both directions. Jesus is giving us the truth. It's, this is wisdom. You are so broken and so guilty, you need to hear the truth from John. You need to hear this message that, that, that if you're going to be ready for the Messiah, you need to repent. You need to hear this message. You are more broken than you think you are. Plus, there really is, there really is life and joy and forgiveness to be found in the risen Lord Jesus. There really is. The news really is that good. Make that message known, Jesus says. Do that and be great. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we come before you this morning and we are thankful to you for your kindness in recording these doubts of John. Lord, we're thankful to you for your kindness in recording them because we ourselves have walked through periods of of doubt and despair and discouragement. Our, our cozy faith has crumbled like a Jenga tower. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gentleness with which you responded to John and your kindness to him. Teach us, Lord, from this how to respond to our own doubts and how to respond to the doubts of those that are around us. We are also grateful to you for this clarification about greatness as we see in the life of John. This is, this is a blessing. It's just a tremendous blessing that, that we can testify to the truth about the risen Lord Jesus and so be great in your eyes. What a blessing that is. May we pursue greatness that really matters. Give us a sour taste for unimportant greatness. Lord, um, make us faithful, we pray, in testifying to you, pleasing you, living a life that is satisfying because it exalts the Lord Jesus. Help us, we pray. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus, saying, Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing once more to close our service this morning. Christ is
who knows where we'll be worshiping next week. Maybe downstairs, maybe upstairs. We'll see. If the Lord Jesus returns, we'll be worshiping with him, which would be better by far. Now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. You may be seated.